cook it with emotion. <laughs> yeah, treat it like. The title of this breakout is Cultural Mutation, Harmful or Renewing. I'm your host, Stephen Raspa of Burning, Man, uh, Burning Man's Regional Network Committee and Regional Events Committee. And to set the stage, here is the scope of our discussion today. After many of our in-person official events were canceled due to the pandemic, the culture began to take some new and innovative forms, including online experiences that made the culture more accessible to many, but uh, with less commitment, perhaps, and more anonymity. We've also seen a growth in small, unofficial, and illegal gatherings that have raised some safety concerns. There have been front porch theme camps and backyard burns, drive through events, parades, art maps, placing temporary art and theme camps in neighborhoods and more. The culture is cl clearly scaling and taking new forms of social engagement as it moves deeper into daily life, which is wonderful. But some have raised concerns about whether the principals are taking a back seat to the party and others have called for clearer behavioral standards to set uh, um, and address poor behavior and bad actors. How do we welcome positive mutations and scale the culture in a healthy way without diluting the culture too much? And when can such mutations serve the world better? And when might they go too far and we risk losing what we love? I'm pleased to introduce our esteemed panelists. Our first panelist is Maka. Uh, Maka is a burner and co-founder of the Burner em uh, Embassy in Berlin. She works as a senior urban designer for the city of Amsterdam and strives to connect the Burning Man principles to her professional practice. She took part as a co-organizer of Burning Bear and Zum Brennenden Barin, Barin, I, I mutilate, mutilated that, I'm sure, in Germany and has been part of assorted camps and projects at various European burns. Our next uh, panelist is Diana Monsberger. Diana is the chair of the Borderland, which is the largest Nordic burn. She joins us today from Denmark, and she is also a member of Blivande, a creative hub in Stockholm. She's passionate about big ideas that make the world more interconnected, human, and sustainable. Our third panelist is Colette Crespin. Colette is Director of Kindling and Virtual Experiences for Burning Man Project. She is passionate about creating radically inclusive, inclusive ways for our community to connect year round and excited to have just launched the Virtual Burn Experience and Kindling for 2021. So thank you uh, to each of our panelists uh, for uh, joining us and everyone here today to discuss and explore this very rich and interesting subject, some of which was touched upon already in the plenary. The first uh, question I'd like to ask is what positive mutations of the culture are you excited about from your region or your work or just generally? And can you share some examples? I think, um, why don't I start with um, Maka, since I introduced you. What positive mutations of the culture are, are you particularly excited about, uh, either from uh, events that you have uh, experienced or your own work? Mm. Thanks, Stephen, and thanks, everyone. I feel super humbled to be here uh, speaking now, because I must admit that COVID also has hit us hard. Um, but... Positive mutations, I think there's a lot and I'm excited about all of them. Like um, last year, even though all the big burns were canceled and most of the European ones are also this year, there's been a lot of micro burns popping up, which were amazing. Like there was kind of a burn event every weekend, just some random people organizing something. And um, the culture was very or has been and is very alive. So at the Berner Embassy Berlin, uh, we noticed that um, a, a space, especially in winter when you have to be inside, doesn't work so well with COVID measurements. Um, camping events still took place. And also um, already before COVID, there were some new forms of burns being organized in Berlin for something so for example, something called home burn, which I think you mentioned like with a backyard burn. This is just events people organize in their own homes. 
and it can be a workshop it can be a lecture it can be whatever and there were several weekends where they were coordinated you could get a map with all the burner homes that were hosting something um other things a new association has been founded so there's three burner associations now in and around berlin um all the microburns or most of the microburns from last year will be happening again this year. Um, and there are also other events born out of the community that I wouldn't call burner events, but they are still very much in the spirit. And what I also notice now is what we discussed also in the panel is that nobody's quite sure what the new norm normal will be. And so a lot of us really feel the wish to bring the spirit and the burner and the principles more into their everyday life. So the whole idea of perma burns is just got a restart, like founding a living community, um, buying land, maybe, or at least yeah, doing something together, not only at the events, but every day. That is a That's great. Uh, <laughs> that is a great sampling of, of things, and I, I particularly love home burn, and the, the really that um, the opportunity for people to just uh, bring to their backyards and to their neighbors and neighborhood uh, some aspect of the culture that they love and share it. Um, how about you, Diana? Uh, what positive mutations of the culture are you excited about, either from your region or uh, or your own work? And can you share a couple of examples of what uh, the positive mutations you're excited about? Sure. Um, in 2020, in April, when everything closed down or regulations and restrictions were put into place, uh, the first reaction from our general community was twofold. Either, oh, no, or actually, oh, yes, we get time to breathe. Uh, which is actually quite interesting because we noticed that a lot of people that are driving forces within the communities are usually occupied and exhausted. And I mean, it's also hard work, so it's not that you don't choose it, but like, uh, yeah, you're really involved in the building and doing of the physical events that, um, of course, respecting the circumstances and everything, it felt like, okay, whew, we are going to breathe for a year. And this created a lot of... Um, incentive energy and free time for physical houses to be um, like in person all year round places to be created. Uh, we have now one in uh, Stockholm that was created three years ago, but has gotten an infuse of uh, motivation and engagement in the past year. I think Gothenburg also in Sweden has gotten a new place. The Danish community is also very, very active and growing. Um, and as far as I know, Malmö is also looking for a physical place. So the establishment of physical places, even though they haven't been opening up, still the building up the structures to sustain them takes a year or two. So that's where a lot of uh, agency has been going to. And then uh, just adding on Mocha, uh, all the micro burns that have been happening um, have been really interesting because they have been tailoring to to a specific crowd for negative, but it's still interesting if, for example, people that are really into Tantra make a tippy burn and a tantric burn, and they spend seven years focusing and putting their energy on one specific topic uh, in one specific direction. I've been hearing, hearing in general a lot of explorations and in that direction, just magnifying what otherwise would be a couple of hours of your burn to something that happens over five, six days. And lastly, I don't know, a couple of you probably have heard the Nordic board Borderland uh, is using the donated 2020 membership to buy some physical space that doesn't necessarily have to be the place where the event will happen, but a place that can be used by everyone that is a member of the Borderland. And that's another stream of energy that was taken out of the crisis. I particularly love that smaller gatherings allow people to go much sort of deeper with one another and uh, even to, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Taylor, sort of more um, uh, specific kinds of uh, passions that they want to organize around. 
Um, it certainly has added more variety to the community. People can choose from among many different uh, burn experiences. Um, and the other thing that I really love that you brought up, uh, Diana, is that all the energy that usually would go into uh, creating uh, our legacy or traditional uh, um, events was able to go in new directions. In your case, uh, and in your community, thinking about permanent space even more. Um, and that's uh, definitely an interesting mutation over time as we've shifted from a focus on ephemeral experience to permanent relationship to land and place and even cities as in Moka's, uh, Maka's work as a uh, urban planner. Well, Colette, I'd love to ask you now, uh, obviously last year when Burning Man, uh, the event could not happen, uh, a lot of uh, focus went into creating uh, multiverse uh, platforms and experiences that brought the culture online. It allowed people to connect and many new people to enter into our community. I'm wondering what positive mutations of the culture you can comment um, on based upon your experience and what you saw and what you're excited about in bringing the culture online and into these new uh, platforms. Firstly, thank you for being here today. It's great to see so many faces. Um, lovely to meet you all. I'm unbelievably excited at the opportunity and possibilities that we have in front of us. I mean, this is really a chance for us to go beyond the borders of time and location and space. And literally people can connect anytime, anywhere, through any device, as long as you have internet. I think this is an exceptional, um, reflection of radical inclusion and immediacy um, in terms of reflecting on last year and how we're looking forward to this year. We had 240,000 unique visits um, and 165,000 participants. That's a really impressive number. And I think what was really interesting about reflecting on last year was that out of those participants, 41% were actually new to Burning Man culture and 51% were millennials. And this, these data points are really fascinating because how do we then look to expand and grow and explore based on this interest? You know, if people can come and tap in from anywhere who may not have been able to come to Playa, we've got a real social responsibility and also a massive opportunity. So some of the things that we've been really excited about this year in particular, is working with our partners, our licensed worlds, and really helping to cultivate relationships with them, helping to support them with intake processing, um, their content management, you know, working with them, creating things like VEST, which is our online ranges and support systems, um, really helping them to feel empowered to have their own disclaimers, to understand their own parameters for, you know, accessing content, any age restrictions or age appropriateness, having their own disclaimers and liabilities, and also really supporting in terms of what decommodification means in an online realm. You know, do we want to be selling things? Not really. How do we want to show participation? How do we want people to engage with us? Um, we've been helping by creating some guidelines together to really try and create a structure that we, we're still decentralized, so everyone's responsible for their own projects, but there's kind of a guideline of saying, you know what, based on our 10 principles, perhaps this makes a bit more sense than that. But there's still some fluidity of saying, these are still your events. If you guys want to go and do fundraising, go do it, spread your wings. We're not here to confine and control you. We're here to just be the space for you guys and to provide support so you can then go and spread your wings. But I think it's an incredibly powerful opportunity for us in terms of acculturation and onboarding and us really teaching what those principles are. I often say this to the team, you know, think of it as um, what's your virtual dust roll and bell gong, you know, as you come on to Playa for the first time, who are your virtual greeters that you meet? What's your first touch point as your experience to the Burning Man culture from a virtual capacity? So those are the things that we're really excited about. Thank you. And you know, you touched upon uh, some of the challenges. So I think I might want to stay with you on this next question. Um, let's get into a little bit of the dirt uh, here. What negative mutations have uh, 
each of you perhaps seen in your own work as community organizers? What are you perhaps concerned about going wrong with our culture? For example, SantaCon was uh, originally a, count, uh, a culture hacking disruption created by members of the Cacophony Society with very anti-consumer messaging uh, associated with it. And it gradually became a drunken bar crawl adopted by bars to help drive liquor sales. So that's not really a direction I would like to see the culture go, but what have you seen that might uh, be cause for concern or going too far or that simply keeps you up at night a little bit or they could go wrong? And Colette, I'd like to stay with you because you touched a little bit on you know, um, some challenges um, um, like with um, giving newbie orientation so people understand the culture. Um, Maybe you can speak to some of the uh, the challenges or uh, even potential negative aspects of the mutation of the culture and bringing it online. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the main things we've been experiencing is around censorship and appropriateness. You know, when you go to Playa, if you're under 18, as long as you're with an adult and you're accompanied when you go in the gate, there's, um, there's a, a self-reliance in terms of what you experience and what you access. You know, you get carded to go to bars and, and such like that. So there's there's a, a way of moderating or you know, policing is not the right word, but I think you understand where I'm coming from, of kind of keeping people safe. And it's very hard to do that online. And it's it's tricky to say, you know, here's access to an experience, but if everybody's just co-curating together and it's very live, how do you moderate that and keep people safe? And, and then if you have age restrictions, then are you excluding certain groups that perhaps you wouldn't necessarily exclude on Playa? So that's been a very tricky one for us to navigate. Um, Vest has really helped, uh, which thanks to Tranquility and her team, it's been really supportive of having uh, kind of these online rangers providing assistance, educating, mediating, doing those sorts of things. But ultimately, because it's an unknown realm still, and we're still there's so much transition from in-person into online, the litigious nature of this is still quite um, sensitive and getting insurance for, you know, when you do an in-person event, it's quite easy to get public liability insurance, whereas to get insurances for this kind of stuff online is still kind of tricky. So we're all sort of navigating this new world together. Um, some of the other things that have come up for us is, is really around decommodification. You know, it's again, it's so much more straightforward on Playa to say, okay, once you come into those gates, there's no financial transaction and it's all about gifting. How do you gift online? I mean, do you give Bitcoin to someone or like an NFT? Does it like, how do you do that? It's such an, a different interaction. And so much like how Michal Onen talks about how you can have emotional engagement online, you know, we're sort of thinking about, well, how do you do gifting? And it, and then is it an upsell and is that decommodification? Am I then having financial transaction? Like, what is that? So there's definitely some very new and big challenges that we're experiencing. Luckily for us with the licensed worlds that we work with, they're all absolutely incredible and hugely talented. And we're having less of the concerns around the Santa Con and the kind of the more bastardization and sort of like throwing out to the wind and and spreading across the, the areas that are, are like not so aligned with the principles, but it is something that's very much in the community and, and helping to navigate those conversations can sometimes be tricky, you know, because what is the line of what's acceptable or not acceptable, so. Well, it's in, in, uh, I appreciate your focus on sort of gifting, because I think even in our in-person events, sometimes we think of gifting in too much of a material way and not in, in an experiential way or just holding space for one another. And a lot of people don't really think as deeply about gifting as they should. So perhaps the challenges online will uh, encourage people to really think much more deeply about what is it about themselves and their presence and what they can offer others uh, what gifting really can mean. At the same time, I think it's it's really quite interesting. Like I, uh, my experience in a couple of the worlds where some groups that were theme camps uh, were well-meaning, but maybe linked to a YouTube video. And then you had a, a an ad pop up in the middle of what should be a decommodified experience. So it'll be interesting, I think, to see how the uh, either the platforms or the communities resp re respond to that to say, 
no, I really do want a, a decommodified space. And it, you know, it's not enough just to promote, you know, what you have going on or let's keep ads out of it. But that's it, it's a, such a unique and interesting world. And I had such a fantastic uh, conversation with uh, a couple of people who are not physically able to uh, to go to Burning Man or to regional events, including a paraplegic who said that they were thrilled to have their first burn. And that was their first burn and experience of the culture. And one of the things they said was how wonderful all the people were. I'd like to uh, shift now, uh, Diana, let's go to you and, and see like what negative mutations of the culture have you seen or what keeps you up uh, sort of uh, at, at night about the way things might go wrong uh, as we push ever further into everyday life in these new forms. Yeah, so um, I haven't been much in the online world. So thank you so much for that insight. It was super interesting. Um, yeah, for me, the question, especially being someone that is, we don't really like the word leadership at the borderline, but just for a concept to say, like in a leadership position, I've just seen how um, there has actually not been a lot of new people coming in the last uh, year. Um, first of all, our groups have been in itself, even the bigger community that in my reality in Stockholm is maybe 500 people that I kind of know. Um, even that group has been quite homogenizing because of COVID. You meet and burn with a selected 50 people. That was the max amount of people that we could meet last summer. So uh, there is actually quite a little exchange of ideas and um, also a little bit of lack of innovation in that aspect that is, I think, one of the most important or like special things in burn to me being, um, yeah, encountering people that are super, super different from oneself. Like, wow, I probably would not never have met you if it wasn't for this event. Like, this is something that I'm missing and that I hope that our culture can regain quite quickly. I'm quite optimistic about it. So that's that. And the second part is, um, yeah, that, um, it has been also, again, from a leadership aspect, it has been hard to give on the torch. Like I was ready to leave the board at Borderland. We have a moving board that about like every th three years, uh, it's time for you to go and someone else to take over. First, maybe as a secretary, but then as a chair, whatever. It's, a, it's basically a school. And then you start your own efforts and type of things. And it feels a little bit because now we didn't have borderland for two years that uh, I don't really have anyone to pass a torch to because we didn't have this natural um, speed people stepping in and the trial phase and an involvement phase. So yeah, it's a completely different position. It's maybe not really a problem of culture, but it's a problem for what I perceive that the borderland has in the coming year. That's a very real uh, challenge in, in our community, which in, particularly in yours, where you really uh, have a completely decentralized and co-creation approach to doing things that like you kind of have to meet one another on the ground, doing things in a deeply experiential way to pass that uh, learning uh, forward and allow new people to step into leadership. Um, yeah, that's that's interesting. So in some ways, the in-person culture may have stalled a little bit um, when things went, uh, even though uh, the culture moved online in different forms. Maka, how about you? What uh, you know? What negative mutation, mutations have you uh, been uh, been seeing, or possible uh, either dilutions of the culture or fragmentation of it, um, or what just uh, causes you a bit of concern, or you think we should keep an eye on? Uh, I first want to to also agree with Diana, and, and sorry if I repeat it a bit, but um, both aspects uh, also con yeah, are a source of concern for me because, for example, the Berna Embassy, we noticed, especially now during the year where nothing much could happen, was basically carried by especially one person and a few more. And um, it were always the same that were there. And we kept having this discussion, okay, how long do we do this if, if there's no exchange with the community or if they don't take up the space or things like that. And the other was also the, 
the microburns, of course, because they are so small, are often very exclusive. So they are friends and family. And um, sometimes there are some virgins being invited, but more often not. And if that keeps on going on, it's of course a pity. And I don't know how you can change that, I must admit. Um, what I saw in Germany, but that was already actually before Corona, was that um, there are some commercial events starting, coming up, that are also carrying the name Bern. You have Burning Beach in Hamburg, you have the Bern Night in Munich, and um, they are sometimes organized by people who were at Africa Burn or at Burning Man and want to carry the spirit of Burning Man into uh, the cities, but they are very strongly commercial. So um, it's, it's difficult, I think. In these two cases, uh, some local burners and regional contacts picked it up and really proactively looked for contact with the people and, and also made a stand at the event. But um, that's a very real danger because, of course, it's not a trademark. So you can't forbid someone to call it that way. And also they do it sometimes really out of a good heart. Like they love the party so much. They love the music. They want to carry it out there. Um, for myself, I think the commodification is the biggest risk and danger. And um, that's, I feel that sometimes then Burning Man is turned into a product but maybe that already happens at the big burn burns themselves in a way, if you see some of the camps and how they develop and how exclusive some things are. So I think it's up to us to change that and to keep the communication going. Because for me, the principles are mostly dynamic and you have to live them and to talk about them. And for some people, some things are more important than, than for others, but we have to keep yeah, talking about that in the communities and also go out and proactively approach other people. So that was also one of the ideas, of course, about the embassy. And that's the third challenge I want to talk about that if we have these physical spaces, especially in cities and as the embassy in the city center, um, it changes what we can do there and what we can't. Like also the, the kind of the, the focus within the principles change a lot more to civic responsibility, way less radical self-expression. Um, and I think that's super interesting, but it means also changing the culture. And for a lot of people, it, it also means questioning, does it make sense for us if we can't be naked, if we can't have loud music, if we can't just do what we want? Um, I, but again, there, I think it's good that we have this challenge and that we talk about it and we try it out. And the same is if you actually buy land who has the right to use it as is discussed in Borderland and, and are there people who have more rights that live there or how do you keep that open and inclusive? I think we are at a very challenging but also super exciting time because all of these things are tried out now. You've touched upon um, commodification of the culture and uh, you know commercialization and how do we protect it? Uh, and IP issues, which you know, uh, Burning Man has often worked with uh, many regional groups to try to preserve uh, intellectual property on behalf of the entire community. So it does mean something. So we have tried to uh, enforce uh, intellectual property, um, but far more, I have to say that the biggest uh, tool seems to be um, Members, when members of the community talk to producers and say, hey, you know, like this actually means something, don't associate with the culture if you're only going to, if you're, you're really just doing it to uh, drive sales and have um, uh, vendors and all sorts of other things and uh, not more fully embody what it means to be, quote, a burn. But you're right, it's quite complicated. At the same time, we want people to know about the principles uh, because we think that the discussion around the principles can lead to positive uh, cultural shift and change in the world. So 
for my next question, um, do we even care if things go wrong so long as the overall impact on society remains positive? What is the downside to being co-optive and having the culture potentially just diminished or watered down? Uh, I'm, I'm curious if any of you have thoughts about that. And actually, Mo Maka, it might be good to stay with you a little bit longer since you, you raised a little bit about that. And then I'd love to hear from either of our other panelists. I don't have a, a real answer to that. I actually first want to ask back, like, how do you measure if the influence is still positive? Like, That's a great I question. Don't know. <laughs> So, um, yeah, you know, measurement is a big thing. You know, we Burning Man Project, we talk all the time. Well, what's our, our sort of measures of success? Is it number of people reached? Like for me, the thing that, that is most meaningful, but quite impossible to measure is number of hearts and minds blown open. Uh, the power of, of sort of positive uh, um, thinking and uh, uniting people around their passions and interests to motivate positive social change. But these yeah. are things that are kind of difficult to measure. So you're you're right. How would we know if we're we're succeeding in a way? I mean, I absolutely care. So that's yes, personally, super important to me. Then again, as with a lot of things, there's so much going on that we don't know about, probably, I guess. So it's also it's nothing you can control. And I also think it's nothing you should control because the principle and the culture is very dynamic to me. And it's always has been. There's new principles coming in and people interpreting the principles on their own way. But um, well, and they were written. These things are important, yeah. like like meetings like this. And I I love I actually love COVID for the microburns for for the online opportunities. I mean, there's been mm. this one clo global event um, that started with two great burners the the failed teleporter experiment who made this global burn so that you can have small local burns during burning man and um, connect with a big burn and i think the online world is a very very great opportunity for that and and to keep the growth and the discussion going mm -hmm. and also the physical spaces like the burner embassy when we didn't have to lock it down was always open and people actually really walked in and asked what's happening here who are you what are you doing mm -hmm. yes. yeah and, and to to your point the principles were written in a way to encourage people to think they're not rules um and uh they describe in in a way the the conditions that um and best parts of the culture that allow has allowed the culture to evolve um for our other panelists, uh, what is the downside of being uh, co-opted and having the culture potentially, you know, reach a lot more people but be diminished? I wonder if uh, um, Diana or um, Colette would either of you like to comment? Colette. Yeah. Um, I firstly just want to bring up a metaphor that someone um, told me a very, very long time ago that I find so relevant, particularly in times of COVID. But when you hold sand in your hands, if you hold it too tight, it kind of trickles through your fingers and you're left with no sand in your palm. Whereas if you cradle sand very lightly, it, it's abundant, right? And I, I've been really, I use this metaphor a lot uh, when I'm thinking about this because um, we can't hold on to everything and we can't control everything. And I think that's something as human beings is generally a struggle day to day and has generally been a struggle throughout COVID because our lives have been turned upside down. I really love what you said, Mocha, around the fact, I think there's some incredible things that have come out of being able to connect virtually. You know, I'm speaking to people in countries that I never would have had an opportunity to meet with. And that's just so fantastic. Um, but with us being, a movement or a movement of people. It's a wave in the sea. Our boat is not going to stay static. And this is the wave that we're riding right now. So we have to surrender to that to a certain extent. We can hold our principles. We can have a good boat, right? You don't want to have a dinghy in the ocean. So you can have a strong boat, but you've got to ride those waves and 
kind of relinquish the need to control all of that as we evolve together, seeing how it emerges. You know, there's the nagual and the tonal, the known and the unknown. And this is an unknown and it's, it's, it's very powerful. And if we try and hold on too tight, we won't be able to explore the possibilities of what could be created out of the unknown. Touching on the data and the measurements, I do think it's possible to measure our engagement, you know, by having NPS surveys, by having engagement questions, qualitative and quantitative data. We're big fans of that in our team. And, you know, it's something that we're really advocating for to get that feedback back from as many people as possible to then to dissect it and say, well, you know what, that really worked. That really didn't. And who came to this and who came to that? And, this is really boomer centric and this is really gen z centric and there's also a whole new generation of the gen z's that are interacting in a very different way even to the millennials and the boomers you know and we have to accommodate for that and that doesn't mean that we're um loosening what the principles are it's just the way in which we're discussing them and bringing them into fruition that makes sense. Yeah. I like your your emphasis on discuss the discussion about uh, the principles, and uh, that you said that we can hold to our principles, but also hold them loosely and allow them to evolve in other ways. One distinction that I sort of find very helpful in my own work is making a distinction between an official regional event and allowing for unofficial things. And we often actually um, work quite closely with many unofficial things to try to walk this line between getting their help to maintain our intellectual property and not say, for example, Burning Man regional event or whatever it is, um, but saying you're part of the family, we love what you do, what you do is important because it is, whether they're official or not. But then when an official event is recognized, it really is held to a higher standard and embodies, it's like a stronger signal of the culture in a way. That's one way that has been helpful, I think, sometimes in walking this line of, uh, you know, not holding the, the, the sand too tightly and, and letting it be abundant. Diana, I wonder if, if you have any thoughts about, you know, what's the downside of the culture being co-opted um, or does it matter? I, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I, I think that uh, Nordic burners have been very inventive about uh, just turning things over to the community. I think of um, the urban burn, for example, in Stockholm, where you just rented a place and said, here, community, you figure it out. No placement, no placers, no schedule, just let the, you know, the community really co-create in a raw space. So that's an excellent example, I think, of being very like just open and trusting and talking about setting some basic parameters. This is legal, this is not legal. Here are the principles. Now you do it. What do you what do you think about? the, you know, is there a downside uh, to the culture being co-opted? I don't really think that there can be. I really do believe that culture goes in iterations and sometimes it's going to be interpreted in this way and sometimes it's going to interpret it in that way. But in a general perspective, I really do believe that, I think I wrote in my note, like the baby is out of the crib. Um, and it has been for a long time with Birmingham. And I think there are a lot of events and subcultures and, and movements that are inspired by, but not identify as Burning Man. So yes, we can, I think it is, it has a value to curate more than moderate, uh, but curate and support events to, her, to hold a certain standard. Um, but uh, yeah, what has happening a lot with the microburns here is that they added principles and deleted others. Uh, the same, for example, with our organization, with a um, member-based co-created organization at Stockholm is that they realized that decommodification doesn't really work in a permanent context. In reality, in collaboration with city, it becomes more very, very difficult. But they have added another principle kind called ownership. And that's basically a, a desire and drive to be a grown up um, and realistic in any possible way. And also understanding that you make mistakes, but at the same time, you, you know, like this, yeah, own it, you know, be a grown up and, and live it. So it really feels 
yeah, I, I, do, I, I think Burning Man is doing and has done what it needs to do in the world. And that's like curation is not the way to go, but support, but also allowing for evolution to happen. If I may direct, uh, directly um, yes, react to something you said, I, I think um, there are ways to keep a physical space also decommodified. Like the embassy, of course, we of course we thrive on the very low rent that we only have to pay the service costs. But since it's more or less run, not run by, but uh, put under the name of the association, and it's been financed by um, yeah people giving donations. It works and I think that's one of our main principle that at least I want to keep it free and if anybody wants to have a workshop there where people pay, pay for it no that's very clear no it's it should be open for any, everyone and so all the events should be open for everyone and that's why we don't want people to have to pay for it yeah I also I'm mean, curious in responding to that because we had a similar place Moka I think you remember the old node yeah yeah Stockholm. We visited, there was a ELS in 2018, I think. Um, and that was a very nice place that we got for very, very cheap. But when it got demolished, out of the sudden, the organization was homeless in one of the cities with the biggest, you know, with super, super high, high rents. So like what a couple of individuals, more or less also including myself, realized is the need to open up a company to mm. get credibility, funding in a sense of a co-working and maker space to then, then give a home to that organization that still runs with this premises. But it's like, okay, we're kind of, yeah, it's twisted, but in a way it's, it's, it's I guess, a, a bite of reality that we got kicked out of this almost free space. Um, yeah, we, we are having the same discussions or similar discussions here. So yeah, yeah. how far can you go? Yeah, exactly. And I don't know, I just want to be daring in saying that, that we have now an area that is a area in redevelopment where the house is, um, that it's got an old harbor and it's gonna be developed into a new complete area. And the ambitions have changed into being an organization that just burns to an organization uh, in an ecosystem of companies and nonprofits and non-for-profits that actually help the city and urban development first redevelop that area with principles. So it's like, yeah, we are bending, we are being more commodified, but like the ambition has grown into something else. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up decommodification. Uh, and I, I'd like to just offer that, you know, that when that principle was written, a distinction was made between um, commerce and commodification, and that you can have ethical commerce um, commod uh, when you commodify human relationships and it becomes some completely transactional and devoid of uh, meaningful relationships and respect. So when you slap down your money at, at a coffee shop, don't even look at the person and you have a transaction, you get your coffee, that, that would be a commodified experience in a lot of ways. And, we uh, and the culture tr has tried to create an alternative to that. It doesn't mean that, that um, ethical use of commerce can't be a part of it. So I would challenge um, even burner entities forming to think about what de decommodifi decommodification can mean as an operating entity functioning in the world. Because that's the gray and messy frontier for us in many ways. Um, and I, I, it, so decommodification doesn't necessarily always have to mean free. I mean, we charge for tickets for our events to cover expenses, for example. Um, but it, this is, uh, I think, everybody's uh, fear. In fact, I remember Marion Goodell saying that, that, that her greatest fear is the commodification of the culture. So it's right that we really spend a lot of uh, time here uh, now and moving forward thinking about what does decommodification mean and how do we do, you know, exist ethically in the world and do our work? Um, and when do we go too far? Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you raised this, Stephen. I think it's a real talking point, uh, particularly with our licensed partners. And just in general, when I listen to people talking, you know, ticketing an event and generating income or having philanthropy or being sustainable is not dirty, right? Like we all have to pay bills and there's a certain infrastructure that we have to do. I mean, I'm working with our six licensed worlds and they've got bills to pay. They've got server costs to cover. Like people are already donating so much of their time 
but to what you've just noted on it's like where you're coming from and what you're bringing to that space you know we've made it very clear with our worlds that you can ticket your event because there's a value of being a participant to help contribute to this infrastructure of the production of the event but when you get in you can't sell lollipops and you know whatever else you want to sell when you're in there because that that's a commodified a commodified transaction right but there's this kind of fear of being able to generate income or raise money or capital to help support projects that can actually then support other people in the community. And so it's making that distinction is really important that it's not bad, but it's just where we come from, how we go about doing it and how we share that information and what, to your point, the value is when you have that transaction. And again, back to the point of interaction and gifting, it's something very interesting to explore in an online realm. How do you create that experience so that it's decommodified um, whilst you're in a transaction as well? So. I, mean, I, I feel like we could have a whole panel really just discussing this. I mean, really, this is like it's sort of the elephant in the room many times when we uh, move throughout, you know, through the world with our culture and try to figure out how to really embody the best parts of it and not lose what we love. I, I, I just want to I yes, just yes. want to uh, add one thing from from my work and, and Raspa, you know it, of course, but um, that Amsterdam actually, because um, Amsterdam is also one of the cities dying of its own success. So all the creative people get thrown out of the city more or less. So they now tr have an experiment um, how to incorporate free spaces. So literally freie Räumte into the normal city and into normal um, real estate development. And it's a real challenge, but so the cities also see that they have to do something to, to keep free creative spaces either in public space or in built space and keep that for everybody i'm so glad you brought that up because uh without realizing it so many of our cities have turned into real estate products instead of serving their social function which should be to bring people in meaningful relationship with one another to be mutually supportive uh, you know sustainable all of these things so that's uh, a wonderful um, reminder, Maka. I have one other question and then I want to open things up for uh, further uh, comments and, and questions. And I think this is a really you know, empowering kind of question to ask. Um, what do you think we as burners can do to encourage positive cultural mutation and, and experimentation and still keep things from going off the rails in a bad way that reflects poorly on all of us as burners? I mean, I really would welcome uh, uh, all of your thoughts and many times members of uh, our regional network committee and uh, leadership at, at Burning Man have to think a lot about this. Like, and we need sort of the community's help in how to uh, steward the culture and, and hold the larger container of the culture, but also these many small containers in a way that, you know, that when they spill over, they spill over and create something wonderful instead of just being something that we might look back on and say, oh, it didn't wor work out so well after all. So what do you think uh, we as burners can do to encourage positive cultural mutation and experimentation and keep things from going off the rail? Um, who would like to, can I jump in, Stephen? Um, Hi. <clears throat> let me let me hear first from the panelists, and then I'd, I'm happy to open that up. In fact, I am going to open that up right after we hear from the panelists. Hold your thought. Yeah, I um, I have a thought. If it's okay for you, uh, yeah. Yes, Diana. Um, and I think actually, from from uh, from this leadership perspective of 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 being a burner, I think what we can really do is have conversations. Um, like I think generosity is one of the light leading principles in the center that I'm part of uh, in Stockholm and also in my life. And I think one of the main things that we can actually give um, is time. It doesn't mean that we always have to give it, but like having these conversations. Um, and if you have the energy, just spend this one more time explaining to someone why you're doing this and what it means to you and what it has changed in your life. And I think this is really important because 
if people hear stories and how important a certain experience has been to you, they get curious about it and they will talk to their friends and they will decide to go to a burn. And then in the burn itself, they will seek experiences that are not just the party, but similar to those that you described. So I think we as oldies and people that have been around for a while can, um, can give a lot of that, a lot of stories to others and to be inspired. So that's like what I think we can do. Uh, I absolutely agree. I also wrote down for that, keep talking, be proactive and also really um, be open-minded. Like, like, as a lot said, also, yeah, burn, burning is a process, not a product. So it's like, um, what, are, what am I giving? What can I work with here? And what, what do you need to make this a good experience or to make you want to be part of it? So not have this really string mind. Burning Man is like this. No, what do you think it is about? That's what you just said, Mocha, um, that it's a process and not a product. My little kids knocking at the window next to me. Um, for our world, we've created some guidelines and we sat with them and we talked them through and kind of gained consensus. You know, what do we think about peak modification? What do we think about the use of IP? What do we think about, you know, interact like all the different kind of elements and we just created consensual guidelines together and I think it's really um interesting in terms of those that are recognized to your point uh Stephen you know those that are affiliated and then those that are not if you've got guidelines there and then to your point Diana people kind of go through the, the food chain and talk about stuff um particularly with the you know the space of hive labs i think is a great example of where we can really start to have those conversations and ideate using the tools that burning man is trying to put out into the community to help decentralize and make it more uh, self-reliant so that you're not relying on coming to burning man to ask permission or to do something but there are generalized guidelines that are going around and then spaces to talk so hive's a great example you know um kindling there's always space to do breakouts like this and have these kinds of conversations and have them open across different time zones to be able to provide those those spaces and I think those things are really important to help us keep kind of figuring and, and navigating this together so. thank you for those uh, reflections and now I, I would like to welcome questions and comments by our esteemed participants if it's a short question you can just drop it into chat and indicate if it if it, it is for <clears throat> someone in particular uh, and otherwise, uh, if you go down to the bottom part of your screen, you can raise a hand um, under the reaction menu, and then uh, Jim can uh, call on you. But I think, did I hear Andy's voice? Andy, I, I, yep, you're right there. So Andy, why don't you unmute <clears throat> yourself? And then once you've spoken, just take your hand down so the next person can ask their question. Andy. Hi, Stephen. So this is Andy Hanneth, uh, Tetris. Hello to everybody, lots of familiar faces. Um, I really agree wholeheartedly with uh, everything that's being said by the panel. There's been some excellent points made. Uh, and the most recent point, uh, mentioning stories, keep telling your stories. This is, for me, it's always been the most fascinating part is, is telling them, hearing them and, uh, and sharing them. Because that can sometimes, especially in this online world we're in at the moment, really help people to get a better take on it more swiftly. Um, and I think there's an extra layer here that we can add in regarding social media, because I, I stepped up and volunteered to be an admin on the Burning Man 2022 Facebook group, and we've grown to like 100,000 members. And so uh, I wanted to have, you know, try to contribute to, um, it's difficult, like not moderating so much the content, but you know, there is an awful lot of nonsense and um, commodified um, events that try to get put in there. And so, and I could see that it wasn't striking a very good balance. So I jumped in and, and told them what my history was and my, my roles in the organization experience. And so they, they let me in and they've really appreciated it. They've been very open to it. So it's not like they were particularly mis, you know, mis, um, misguided or anything. They were really appreciative of me coming in and helping them to understand better what is and isn't uh, per se allowed. We try to have some flexibility, and I think this is where the extra layer is. Um, you know, I've got a hundred thousand people in this group, 
And so some content from the org that is to like newbies, we have a lot of virgins, people who have just literally seen a video or two online, joined Burning Man 2022. And then what do they see? They just see the odd random post from people. So I'd like to think about utilizing this kind of group and opportunity to share stories, which I have started to do. And the same with events. When I attend an event, I always put my hand up and do a talk or a workshop, um, usually around principles, usually around gifting. And, and I tell some personal examples and ask other people to contribute. And I've had some great feedback. Um, I'm involved with the organization, the Sparkle Burst. We're going to be bringing back again this year and the Co-Reality Collective. And so some of the most positive feedback from people who have just joined an event for the first time, knowing almost nothing about it, has been those stories. And I think to go full circle and start sharing them back in some of these groups uh, will be really well received and will help a lot of people gain a swifter understanding. I think that resonates with a lot of people. Um, I think that uh, Costume Jim, you had your hand up next. Do you want to make a comment or ask a question? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Stephen. Always great to see you. And uh, yes, I did get my rabbit out just for you. Oh, good. Sucking up to the moderator, I see. Yeah, there we go. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, very, uh, you know, very stimulating chat. I mean, I started taking notes and I, now I had just that want to pick one of the five questions or points I would have liked to make. Um, but first of all, just want to specifically say hi to Maka. My uh, formerly Berliner partner keeps reminding me of my promise to someday move to Berlin. So uh, <laughs> uh, we, we want to spend more time there. So uh, go, go come come over. There's lots <laughs> happening. Yes, yeah, we, we shall. And um, and uh, in specific, uh, 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 Diana, hearing your your secession planning um, issues, uh, uh, my background is HR and I think costume cult success, besides just you know having a lot of fun, has always been about um, secession planning. I, I have an acronym, you know, being a former corporate guy, I have an acronym for it: ABR, always be recruiting and cultivating people. And really, uh, a big part of our culture is training people on skills they don't have. Uh, they may be a, an accountant by day, but wow, they're a great producer. And, the, and, and just recognizing these skills and helping people find themselves. I mean, I didn't know how to run anything um, 20 years ago when I first stumbled into this world. And, you know, arguably we've created a ton of stuff here in New York. And, and we're not just about the burn. We, you know, Halloween parade is where we started and mermaid parade and uh, and yeah, maybe we are the men behind the curtain at that big ugly thing called SantaCon now, uh, which is a great place to recruit people. Uh, a lot easier to recruit people there than at like the Met. The Met. <laughs> so all of these things do have value. Uh, conscious creative culture is what I talk about, uh, the 10 principles being very central to this. And it sort of gets to this question of decommodification, which I want to ask about because in my discussions with you know people out there in San Francisco and even with Larry uh, in the day, um, it wasn't necessarily about selling things. It was about um, uh, people, you know, outsiders coming in and trying to put their brand on the culture and try to look cool by association, right? Um, and uh, and so, what is decommodification exactly? You know, we sell tickets. And now, because so many artists are in trouble, uh, we're probably going to start instituting something we stayed away from and, you know, little artists kiosks at some of our events. So these individual artists can help make money so they don't have to like fully buy into Amazon or even Etsy, which is getting uh, more corporatized as it becomes, uh, you know, as it's a publicly traded company. So what is the commodification? Uh, is it just this? branding thing or is it selling things and uh yeah that that's my question well as i said uh actually i'd love it do any of the other panelists want to comment on that i'm happy to speak to it but yeah i think it's it's uh yeah. very, also personal like i'm i'm a complete anti-capitalist so for me it probably goes farther than for other people 
but of course you you sell tickets you have to kind of cover your costs uh, if you have an event or we at the embassy for me it's about making profit out of something that for example the community creates that is not okay and we advocate to our world you know ticket to cover your costs and if you make profit put that profit back into the community to help create more virtual experiences and you know we've been quite i feel british when i say strict but um we've been kind of strict on saying you know once you're in the world please don't upsell you know um just don't do it because you wouldn't do it on Playa, so don't do it here and everyone's really understood and been really obliging on that fact. So, um, yeah. I, Jim, I'd like to first say that context is everything. If you are saying that this is what the culture is about and it's an official event, for example, or it's an official experience online that should reflect upon the culture, then I think that there's still that uh, desire and will to be generous and to lead with uh, gifting and generosity over uh, uh, sales. However, to your point, um, artists are suffering and many people need funds and there's no reason why groups can't do fundraisers. Lithuania did uh, a, uh, an outdoor uh, film festival where the proceeds went to lo help local artists. Just call it a fundraiser and be upfront about what, where those funds are going and be transparent. Um, I'd be a little cautious about mashing together uh, sales in an environment in which we uh, hopefully very soon again will uh, offer a very strong alternative to the usual consumer models. Um, and to your point, yes, commodification, um, using um, brand affiliations, even the concept of a brand instead of uh, an authentic human uh, relationship and a relational experience of the world um, is at the heart of uh, making a distinction between commodification and decommodification. And yeah, to your point, Larry, you know, pointed out that you know, even the, the even the punks tried to make uh, their aesthetic so difficult to uh, turn into a product, but ended up, uh, you know, being commodified and uh, sold in their culture being sold. So it's something that I think we have to remain vigilant about and continue to have conversations about. But it doesn't mean that we can't help artists, um, you know, raise funds. Maybe it's a matter of like, well, which um container are you talking about and diana i see your hand up do you want to comment yeah i want to comment on one difficulty that i'm um, maybe someone in the chat can answer or yeah in general curious about how the different events burns and places handle social media and instagram and all of these things because this is the place today where you have young people and younger people that are below 20 like there's no one is on Facebook anymore which was a traditional way to find people and and invite to events and I I am or like Livanda our house in Stockholm is on Instagram I think in some way because that's created by one person or two it kind of has a voice and through that, it kind of developed a brand that you are really hard trying to fight against. It's not that it's just happen, happen naturally by the way that the platform is designed. Um, and at the same time, um, it's also easier to understand for people that are not part of this community. It's easier for people to understand and, and, and feel curiosity towards something that seemed aligned and then get surprised. But we are dancing a quite difficult dance here because then we have expectations and people come in and with their projects and fulfill those expectations. And we, yeah, we kind of square ourselves. And it has been for me a challenge to navigate that. And I'm oh, asking yeah. all the time, everywhere, like, yeah. how do you do it? How, how can you ethically do social media? Well, I think that is a good question. I mean, I, it doesn't, uh, I, I mean, that, having uh, Instagram or using different uh, communication vehicles as a uh, nonprofit, uh, I don't really think is the problem. But 
Instagramming during a gathering uh, really impacts both immediacy and uh, commodification because it takes an experience that really should be authentic and the intention is right away to uh, in some ways package or associate with the coolness and that is commodif com commodification. So, uh, you know, uh, just as with money, money can be a tool uh, or it can be a, a complete corruption of the goals of any um, individual or entity. But in itself, it is not necessarily evil. It's what you do with it. And are you, you know, ha uh, the, the thing that helps me is asking, is this an authentic, meaningful uh, relationship and exchange? And are people doing it for the right reasons or are they doing it for uh, profit, greed, uh, self-interest only? And if I might make one very last quick point, um, we spent a lot of time thinking about who we'll partner with. Are they an all volunteer 10 principles group <laughs> or are is somebody else uh, making, making, uh, putting money in their pockets. Um, and as, as a group that really did innovate hard on online events, now hybrid events, um, you know, how do we do social and yes, we're bringing our brand online because like we're a live events crew and then we had to pivot on a dime into virtual and we need more people that have those skills. So we are taking our nonprofit vibe and trying to market it to get more people abr always be recruiting so uh mission driven uh with the money all going into the project as opposed to enrichment and that's a you know that's a line that yes we should we should continue to talk about i like your focus on being mission and values driven Absolutely. Um, and Richard, uh, we've got uh, time for one more comment, uh, and then uh, this uh, panel ends at 1230. I'd like to just allow a, a minute or two for thank yous. Um, Richard, what is your comment hey. or question? Um, well, uh, it's a great panel. Uh, it's great to be here. It's a great gathering. Thank you, Stephen. Good to see you, every. Good to hear everybody. Um, hey, family, all that. So anyway, it's just about commodification decommodification you know um there's as a person who you're you know I, I, the silver lining of pandemic it has kicked everybody into gear invited encouraged whatever to you know to do what we've been talking about for a long time it's not just a one-year event a one-time event you know one time a year event it's a all year long experience that we're bringing to the world at least as i'm inspired is to bring What's inspiring me to others. So, but there's costs. You have to pay rent. You have to art, artist commodification uh, versus decommodification. It's like, you know, and, and I'm also one of the original people starting free space here in San Francisco. So, I mean, it's great to work with free spaces, but there are costs. Art materials have costs, storage have costs, vehicles have costs, insurance have costs, artists have rent, you know, and that, and covering those costs to continue the mission to reach more people, to inspire more people is not commodification. That is survival and growing and evolving to reach more people. And, um, you know, it's a question of like, underserved communities, or are you partnering with a corporation? And it depends, where are you going? But if your purpose, it's kind of, a, what is your intent and what is your purpose? You want to get rich making art? Uh, uh, you know, doing a, you know, BR, BRBC, you know, or do you want to exist? This why you're continuing to grow and reach people. That's all I got to say. Love you guys. I'm out. So um, I think it's okay to make money to continue what you're doing, and don't be confused with that with modification versus decommodification. Yeah, I think once again, you're really empty space for people. Yeah, and I think once again, you're really pointing to um, resources as tools versus ends and being mission and value aligned in how you use assets and resources. Uh, and you mentioned, I think, uh, intention as well. Uh, and to that, I really think adding um, like, is there an authentic relationship or, uh, or not is, is helpful, 
very often. Um, you know, there is an, a, a piece uh, that uh, the, one of the last things that Larry wrote before he uh, left this realm was a, um, a piece about um, logos, branding, uh, and gifting versus commodification. Uh, I, I don't know if we can find it quickly enough to drop into this, um, but it is in the Burning Man Journal. And it's very helpful in a way, but of course, we all want everybody to think in their own ways. The principles are there to further discussion and conversation. Um, and we've certainly had an interesting and marvelous conversation with our panelists. I would like to thank our panelists. Thank you so much, Maka, for joining us from Amsterdam and sharing your wisdom uh, and experience and bringing the culture into urban planning and for the uh, uh, Berner Embassy in Berlin. Thank you, Diana, so much for all of your work with Borderland. And uh, I'm excited to see what happens with Levanda. Uh, and thank you for stepping into uh, a, a leadership and staying in, in it in a very interesting and difficult time to transition. Thank you, Colette, for helping to pioneer taking the culture uh, online for Burning Man and being very open and honest about the challenges that, uh, that we face in trying to do it the right way. And thank you as well to our uh, chat moderator, Jim, AKA Rust. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Ray Cook, our technical moderator and uh, to our note taker, uh, Christine. And thank you to all of our wonderful participants and contributors. Uh, thank you for helping to uh, shape the vessel, carry it with you, move through the world, bring the culture with you, and please help us all figure out how to encourage positive experimentation, not get stuck, but also not go too far off the rails where we look back and say, boy, did we screw that up. Thank you and thank love you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for your knowledge and wisdom, not just today, but every day. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we get to make it up together, and that's the fun part. Be uh, well, I hope everybody. You'll, you'll join us. There are, uh, you know, there's uh, social spaces uh, in the Builder Burn environment. Uh, if you go back to the main menu, there are some options. Uh, Jim, is there anything that we can drop into chat to help people know um, uh, the schedule or what happens next? I will find something. It's going to okay. take just a second. And otherwise, just go back to the main um, uh, navigational menu that you all should have uh, entered through. And uh, you can explore. We've tried to kind of create a social space for people to just hang out and talk and connect. Uh, and then there's a, another whole round two happening uh, uh, for the next time zone coming up momentarily all right love you see all see you live next time hangouts. bye cook it with the motion yeah treat it like it's sacred like it's sacred cook it with the motion you got to cook it treat it like it's sacred gonna make some music together beautiful it is Fantastic to see you again.